library as soon as possible. So here's a copy of the actual book. So that's very nice. Um, so let me explain why I encourage you to do so. Uh, for me, Gorilla Radios in Southern Africa is an exciting and quite diverse edited collection that really documents and critically analyzes the important role that radio played in the region's struggle for liberation. Now, the book was edited by Professor Sekiba Kiba Lechoati and Dr. Tsepo Moloy, as well as Professor Alda Ramoa Sote Saide, who is unfortunately not here with us today. Uh, it was published last year with Rowan and Lidfield's Africa Past, Present and Prospect series. And I have a copy myself and can guarantee that it looks, feels and reads quite lovely. So three important characteristics stand out for me. Guerrilla Radios in Southern Africa's content covers an impressive geographical area. So it gains a diverse array of chapters on liberation movements from Mozambique, Angola, South Africa, Namibia and Zimbabwe, which were able to make use of radio facilities from Addis Ababa to Maputo and Brazzaville to Dar es Salaam. The book also emphasizes the need for historians of liberation to look beyond the confines of the nation state if they want to fully understand how our region's struggle for freedom was shaped and attained. As illustrated by uh, guerrilla radios in Southern Africa, Southern Africa's liberation struggle consisted of an intricate web of local, regional, continental and international dimensions. So by focusing on radios, these different chapters untangle these intricate networks and connections. Another important characteristic of guerrilla radios in Southern Africa is that its content may be, moves beyond just focusing on those liberation movements who took over power after independence. This edited collection also documents and discusses the actions of often neglected movements such as the FNLA, ZAPU, the BCM and PAC. This helps us to decenter existing narratives about our region's struggle for independence. And finally, guerrilla radios in Southern Africa exposes historians of the liberation struggle to a different and innovative type of repository, namely the Sonic Archive. These new types of sources provide us with unique insights that can advance our understanding of how technology was used and perceived during Southern Africa's liberation struggle, even if, as discussed in the book, the Sonic Archive is accompanied by its own set of problems and challenges. As an edited book that approaches the struggle for liberation from a transnational perspective and moves away from only writing histories of the winners, Guerrilla radios in Southern Africa forms part of a noteworthy evolution in our field. It fits elegantly within various recent special issues in the Journal of Southern African Studies and the South African Historical Journal, or larger projects like Sadet's The Road to Democracy, or Arnold Temu and Joel Desneva Stemba's Southern Africa's Liberation Struggle series that have used similar approaches. I would like to congratulate the editors and contributors for this amazing achievement, and especially Dr. Tsepo Moloy, who is a valuable member of our history department at the University of the Free State. So let's have a look at today's program. We'll start with a session during which the two of the book's editors, uh, Professor Lechoati and Dr. Moloy, will reflect on and discuss how this publication came about. Okay. Seki Bakiba Lechoat is an associate professor at the University of the Witwatersrand. He holds a PhD in African uh, history from the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities in the United States of America, and has published widely on Indebele ethnicity, public radio in African languages in South Africa, the ANC's uh, radio freedom, and the political knowledge of production, as well as on popular protest in rural and urban South Africa. Professor Lechoati is currently completing a monograph titled The Politics of Indebele Ethnicity in South Africa from 1960 to 2010. He has contributed to a school history to school history textbooks and through workshops with history with the history workshop. He has been involved in facilitating oral history workshops with history teachers and students across the country. He's currently serving as a member of the ministerial task team of the Department of Basic Education. Dr. Molloy is a senior lecturer at the University of the Free State, uh, Free State at the Clark campus, where he teaches history. 
he had obtained his PhD uh, in history from the University of the Waterfront. Dr. Molloy is the author of Places of Thorns Black Political Protest in Kronstadt since 1976. His research interests include histories of liberation struggles in South Africa and has published on student and youth politics and underground networks. We then proceed to individual presentations by Professor Marissa Moorman, Dr. Ali Shongwane, and Mr. Lloyd Hasvinei, who had con have contributed insightful chapters about Angola, South Africa, and Zimbabwe uh, to the book. Marissa Moorman is Professor of African Cultural Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her research uh, focuses on political and cultural uh, politics and culture in colonial and independent Angola. She has uh, authored two books. Uh, her first is Powerful Frequencies, Radio State Power and the Cold War in Angola from 1931 to 2002 and Intonations, A Social History of Music and National and Nation in Luanda, Angola from 1945 to recent times. Fellowships from ACLS, Fulbright, Hayes and the SSRC have supported her exciting research. Professor Mormon has published on music, fashion, film, radio, and urban space. She's an editor of the Journal of African History and on the edit sits on the editorial collective of the Radical History Review. Dr. Shlongwane is a researcher in the History Workshop at the University of Witwatersrand. He has published on public histories of the 1976 uprisings in the Road to Democracy in South Africa, Volume 7, um, Uprisings, New Perspectives, Commemoration and Memorialization. He is also a co-author of Public History and Culture in South Africa, Memorializing and uh, Liberation Heritage Sites in Johannesburg and the Township Space. Dr. Shongwane's recent publication is Lion of Azania, a biography of Zefania Lekoame Motopeng. Currently, he is also completing a biography of John Nyati Pol uh, Pokela. Then finally, Mr. Hasvinei is a PhD candidate and an academic intern in the history department at Wits University. He is also a fellow with the Emancipatory Future Studies program based in the School of Sci Social Sciences at the same university. His research interests are the areas of environmental history and histories of radio technologies in Southern Africa. He has co-authored two chapters in Guerrilla Radios in South Africa, a very impressive achievement for his uh, career, and he's currently working with a digital storytelling movement named Photo Culture Multimedia in documenting diverse stories of resilience throughout documentary films. Now, after these three individual presentations, Professor Elizabeth Gunner has kindly agreed to act as a discussant of the book. Elizabeth Gunner is visiting professor in the Department of uh, Land L-A-N-C-A-L, I'm not sure what that abbreviation stands for, <laughs> I'm sorry, at the University of Johannesburg. Her research is on performance and social meaning in Africa and on African media, especially radio. Her recent books are Radio Sounding, South Africa and the Black Modern, and the co-edited publication Radio in Africa, Public uh, Cultures and Communities. She is presently researching on gender, voice, and histories of exclusion, on music and migration, and on praise poetry in the context of world literature. Professor Gunner also sits on the editorial board of the Journal of Southern African Studies, African Studies, and Musiki. After the series of presentation and discussions, we will open up the floor to a question and answer session. And finally, we'll end the day's proceedings with a vote of thanks from the University of the Free State Director of Library and Information Services, Ms. Janet Molopiane. I hope you enjoyed this afternoon's lineup of presentations and discussions. So without further ado, let us hear from Professor Lechoati and Dr. Molloy. So the two of you have 20 minutes and yeah, I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Laszlo. Um, I think I'm the first one on the on the list on the program, so I'll start. So um, I'd like to thank everybody for attending uh, this uh, book launch, and and of course, uh, Laszlo, uh, thank you so much for agreeing to chair this uh, session or rather this event. I'll get straight to the point. I'll start with the talking very briefly about. Uh, the process of writing the book. So 
Guerrilla Radios in Southern Africa was originally published by Roman and Littlefield International, as largely has already indicated. Now, this afternoon, we are launching the Southern African edition of the book published by Best University Press. Arrangement, of course, with RN, uh, RNL, that is uh, Roman and Littlefield International. Now, this book came out of two workshops held at VETS in Johannesburg and at Pedagogic University in Maputo in February of 2017. Uh, so, sorry, February of 2017, that is the Jobek workshop, and then November, uh, the same year, uh, in, in Maputo. Uh, and the title, the title of the workshops was Liberation War Radios in Southern Africa, 1960 to early 1990s. So in 2016, I, I took the initiative by submitting an application for funding from the National Institute uh, for the Humanities and Social Sciences, that is the NIHSSL, NIHSS. Uh, it had a catalytic research project funding, so I managed to get that funding. So I, together with my friend and colleague here, uh, Dr. Tsepo Muloi, and two Mozambican colleagues, uh, Professor Alda Romao Saute Saide, and uh, a, another scholar, um, historian, Eleusio Vieges uh, Felipe. We coordinated the workshops and so uh, to the successful execution of this initiative. We are indeed grateful for the generous financial support uh, for the Liberation War Radios project that we received from the NIHSS. Now, these workshops attracted like-minded researchers and scholars based mostly at universities in, the, in Southern Africa. Uh, in fact, only three scholars in the team are based at Northern universities. Now, the one thing we all had in common was that our projects explored the role that guerrilla radios played in the liberation struggle in, southern, in the Southern African region. So this book would not have materialized had it not been for the commitment and hard work displayed by the contributors who engaged in various uh, or rather in vigorous and lively debates at the two workshops in 2017. We received a great deal of support and encouragement for, from colleagues at VETS and Pedagogic University. Most notably, uh, Professor Mucha Musema, the head of the School of Social Sciences at VETS, conducted the official opening of the February 2017 workshop. And uh, Professor Nur Niftahodin gave his unstinting endorsement of the project in its conceptual stage and accepted our request that it be administered within the history workshop. Most importantly, Nur gave insightful comments throughout the two days of the, uh, of the first workshop in Johannesburg. Uh, now, both workshops in Johannesburg and Maputo wouldn't have happened without the sterling work of Antoinette Hose. Now, she is the senior administrator for both the SACHI program in local histories and present realities and the history workshop. Now, Antoinette uh, dealt with the financial aspects and logistics of uh, organizing, uh, from the booking of accommodation, flights and shuttles through to catering arrangements. Now, on the Mozambican side, our appreciation goes out to the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences and Philosophical Science, Professor Bento Rupia, the Director of International Relations Office, Professor Sarita Monjani Hendrickson, and the Director of the Central Library, Dr. Aisa Isak, for making it possible for the workshop to be accommodated at the university. Now, lastly, Monica Sieber clearly did a fantastic job as a copy editor in terms of trying to make the different chapters to read as a coherent piece. So with that background, uh, I think it would suffice now to basically get into the gist of the book and why we actually wrote this book. Why this book? Now, the book project arose from the realization that despite the explosion of research on liberation struggles in Southern Africa, there remained a shortage of studies on the media that the liberation movements employed, and particularly radio. 
Now, guerrilla radio served as a source of alternative information and counter propaganda, spending a considerable amount of time dispelling the messages propagated through the media of the white minority regimes in the region. They also served the most critical role of recruiting freedom fighters for the liberation movements in exile. By looking at different guerrilla radios as, as case studies, the project sought to contribute towards advancing regional scholarship on the histories of these radios and their contestation of the colonial or apartheid state's monopoly of the airwaves. It is about transcending the limitation of the parochial approach of simply looking at guerrilla radios within the nation state by finding connections between these radios and situating them within the context of a common uh, struggle against white minority rule and class and racial oppression in the region. Since the 1950s, radio has been the predominant medium of mass communication in Africa. Not only was radio broadcasting employed by the colonial states in the service of empire, but what this book shows is that the liberation forces also appropriated radio as a weapon in the struggle for independence. With a turn to the armed struggle and movement into exile in the early 1960s, access to a radio broadcasting uh, you know, station became a top priority for the nationalist movements in Southern Africa. Through radio, the guerrilla movement sought to maintain a sonic presence among their supporters at home. It was a means through which they could shape their supporters' political views and behavior, and more especially their activities in resisting white rule. It was about giving them their perspective of what was actually happening in those colonial uh, territories. So the liberation movements also, of course, used other media, particularly print, but radio occupied a very special place in the struggle for independence in Southern Africa. Sound had the most appeal, not least because it was the cheapest and most direct and immediate form of communication. Through radio, the liberation movements could address their supporters instantly and directly behind enemy lines. They could maintain their presence at home without being physically present at home. The appropriation of radio by the nationalist movements, nevertheless, caused severe nervousness on the part of the white minority regimes uh, in the region, unwilling to surrender their monopoly over uh, the airwaves. And there are a couple of uh, chapters in this book that goes uh, into details, kind of talking about the nervousness of, this, uh, of those colonial states. And Marisa's work in particular looks at that aspect. Guerrilla Radios in Southern Africa is a collection of essays on the histories of these radios, at, or rather the radios attached to the armed wings of the liberation movements in the region. It is about the experiences of the broadcasters and the listeners. So, you know, the authors draw quite extensively from the experiences of the broadcasters and the listeners during the era of the armed struggle. Now, using archival sources such as sound recordings of the guerrilla radios and the written records of the colonial state, together with interviews conducted with former broadcasters and listeners, the essays contained in this volume ask complex questions about the social histories and machinations of the stations. They explore the workings of propaganda and counter propaganda and probe the effects of the radios. Uh, or rather the effects that these radios had on the activists and supporters of the liberation movements on the one hand and, and on the colonial counterinsurgency projects on the other. I see my 10 minutes have actually expired. So I'll just, um, uh, excuse me, I'll just uh, say in closing that um, the book is actually made out of uh, uh, 11 substantive chapters plus the introduction. And um, so, and, and, and on that note, because we do have uh, speakers 
uh, in this uh, event who are going to speak specifically to some of their chapters. But the range is quite broad. It's about, you know, the first two chapters focus on uh, the former Portuguese colonies of uh, Mozambique and Angola. The second four chapters are about uh, Zimbabwe. And then there's one chapter which is on Namibia that looks at uh, Swapo's uh, voice of Namibia. And the last four chapters are actually about uh, guerrilla radios in South Africa. Three of them, including mine, actually look at ANC's Radio Freedom. And there's only one that actually does what others have not done before. Uh, that is bringing, you know, the, uh, the, the, the PAC into the equation, looking at PAC's radio. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and I think uh, we, we do have Ali Kongwani in the group. He will also speak about that. And so I want to stop there, having made that um, uh, introduction. And, and Tepo will now follow and take, take, take us forward, focusing on the methodological issues, particularly the use of oral history, among other things. Thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Prapi. Uh, Laszlo, may I continue? You may. Okay. Can you just uh, indicate to me when I'm just about to go over my time? Maybe two minutes left, just indicate that. I'll give you a shout, Tepo. Okay. <laughs> Um, thanks uh, once again uh, uh, to the chair for agreeing, Lazo for agreeing to uh, chair this session, and uh, thanks to everyone, particularly uh, Liz and uh, Marisa. Unfortunately, had to wake up very early. <laughs> but uh, let me quickly talk to two uh, important points, which I think are important for having written this book. Um, I would like to talk to issue of using oral history uh, in documenting the history of the guerrilla radios, especially from the perspective of the people who listened to, to these radios. Um, I, I think you'll all uh, appreciate the fact that, I mean, being uh, illegal radios, uh, it was difficult for everyone, first of all, to, to listen to them. And then secondly, it was an, a, a punishable offense to listen to these radios. If caught, then you might end up in jail. <clears throat> so this uh, brings in oral history nicely as to capturing other voices, particularly those that are not documented. And then time permitting, I will try to demonstrate the significance of oral history drawing from my chapter on radio freedom and the black consciousness movement. <clears throat> First, um, I'd like to point out that conducting res research on the histories of guerrilla radios, uh, mainly focusing on listenership, is a challenge because of their status as illegal radios. Um, because of security reasons and dangers associated with these radios, underground political operatives and ordinary people in the townships, villages and elsewhere, um, they couldn't document, uh, keep, docu keep records of diaries or whatever they were listening to. So it all remained in their, in their minds. Therefore, the use of oral history comes in, in that uh, uh, respect. Um, and the second point that I want uh, to, to, to bring forth is that uh, uh, guerrilla radios in different parts of the world where they were uh, based in exile uh, left, uh, 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 did not leave a documentary archives. Those who managed, like the ANC, it was, it, it, it was rare. Um, uh, people moved from one place to another quite often, but in the process, some of this uh, material also got lost. But the other point to that is that uh, because of the um, precarious nature of exile life, which uh, uh, made uh, this uh, liberation movements to depend mainly on donations to survive, you find that radio, uh, uh, <laughs> it was not a priority. You know, most of the uh, most of the funding will go into 
taking care of the thousands of the uh, members of this liberation movement. So you'll find that the, it, it created a problem in terms of keeping records. So in order to sustain these radios, uh, the broadcasters will recycle the material that caused the loss of valuable uh, sound archives. And because of that, after an independence, now we want to write about this to understand labor, labor, liberation radios, then we find that we, there is not enough material to work on. That is why actually I think all of us uh, who contributed on to this uh, uh, volume, we, we relied uh, heavily on uh, interviews with people who listen to radio, with people who were in the broadcast, <clears throat> were broadcasting from exile. And that uh, for me uh, was uh, brought in very rich information about the influence of these radios uh, in terms of mobilization in, 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 in countries which were, 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 were governed by these white minority regimes. And again, in, in, in my in the case of uh, in my chapter, you find that the influence, uh, especially in the 70s during the PC black consciousness movement, it also led, and this comes from the interviews, it also led to some of the people who have black consciousness adherents joining the, the shifting to the Congress movement politics and ultimately leaving the country. So I, 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 I will uh, uh, contend that uh, the use of oral history assisted us uh, in different chapters, of course, uh, in, in closing this clearing uh, gaps in the archival material that we, we have uh, at the moment. So I'll just, I think I'm left with about two minutes or so. I'll just quickly just give an, a, an illustration uh, as to how in my chapter I was able to <clears throat> use oral history to demonstrate uh, the influence of uh, uh, whatever messages that they received from uh, exile. One of the one of the things that uh, 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 Professor Kwati mentioned uh, when he presented is that it's, it's that instant, you know, that you listen to radio instantly, you get this message, unlike when you're reading. So that was was critical in terms of mobilizing uh, uh, some of the young people in the townships and, and, and elsewhere to finally get to understand the, the ANC, mostly listen to uh, the Radio Freedom. Um, one of the people who writes about this uh, is James Ngulu, who became, who later became uh, a member of Nkonto Wesizwe, and uh, uh, after independence, I think he was part of the leading uh, people in the Eastern Cape, <coughs> Eastern, Eastern Cape, yes. So in his book, he writes, we listened to the ANC's Radio Freedom broadcast from Lusaka and the sound of the opening tune which was saying, uh, uh, followed by a burst of gunfire, excited us. You know, that moment that you hear this, this staccato of gunfire, you, uh, you said, we would imagine ourselves pulling that trigger. And this is not only from Nuga, quite a number of people that I interviewed, for example, who mentioned this. And for them, and together, of course, with other politics, they will de decide. They, they decided that they would join the ANC uh, uh, after leaving the country into into exile. But in addition to Radio Freedom, others in South Africa they also listened to uh, uh, the Voice of Zimbabwe. And one of the people that I interviewed, who later in exile joined Radio Freedom as a broadcaster, he mentions that unlike Radio Freedom, for example. Radio Zimbabwe was very much, the message from Radio was very much militant. And for them, that excited them. So you can see in terms of their, how they remember uh, uh, um, uh, their, their, when they listen to Radio Freedom, that those messages finally managed to influence them to join the ANC and leave the country. So I, I think that my, does my time, Lazo. I'm still doing okay. You have one more minute. So. Oh, great. <laughs> nice. 
I try to keep to, 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 to the time. So basically what I'm saying is that in addition to other sources, also uh, uh, the interviews, oral interviews, played a critical role in shaping the different chapters in the book. And they, I think, and will contend that they enriched the chapters in terms of us understanding the role of the guerrilla radios. I will stop there. Okay, thank you very much for your reflections, Professor Saki Bakiba Lehokoti and Dr. Sepomoloi. So now we move on to our first contributor of the day, uh, Professor Mormon. Uh, you have 15 minutes and yeah, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much for being here. Good morning. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, good, good afternoon to you. Good morning here. Um, I probably won't take the whole 15 minutes. It's not a problem being up early. The problem is other people's demands on my time, uh, namely teaching pressures. So, um, but I'm really delighted to be here. I um, was so happy to be a part of the workshops that were part of the production of this book um, and so happy to collaborate with um, Sakiba, Tsepo, um, Lloyd, everyone else, Alda, Eliseo, um, some of whom were former colleagues of mine from graduate school. So it's just, for me, been a really um, gratifying experience. Um, I'm going to focus on some of the things I talk about in my chapter in the book. Um, I also want to say congratulations to, um, to the editors on the book. Um, I also look forward to teaching the book, I hope, in the spring semester when I'm going to be teaching a class on African liberation struggles and questions of representation. So I'm really excited also to see how it how it works in the classroom. So I'm going to take off on actually a few things that um, that Seppo was just talking about that I think were really important for me in the research I did on um, liberation radios, guerrilla radios in Angola. So um, I'm going to focus on sources a little bit. For me, the question of oral histories was really key. It's what drove me to be interested in um, the MPLA's radio station Angola Combatente and the radio station of the FNLA Voz Libre d'Angola. Um, I would say there's a really sort of rich um, memory of people tuning into those broadcasts and that's part of what actually and hearing stories like that is what drove my interest in the history of radio in Angola more generally. Um, that said, I so I had started to look for other sources and I found um, sort of scant sources in Angola. My sense was that because people had such um, a clear memory of it and told me stories about, you know, hiding under beds, hiding under um, hiding under pillows, going into dark soccer fields to tune in to listen to, in particular, Angola Combatente, that was the radio station of the MPLA, um, that, that the MPLA itself would have had kind of a rich archive on this. Um, but I was disappointed to learn that that, in fact, was not the case. Um, so I had to rely on other things. Um, on the one hand, there was this very rich memory. Um, on the other hand, there were sort of indications in built space in Angola and in particular in Luanda, the capital, um, that pointed to this hi important history of radio, although um, not very loudly. So there's one panel of a mural that's around the military hospital that recounts the history um, of the Angolan liberation struggle. And one panel in that mural um, has a representation of Angola Combatente and um, kind of reaching back to one, something that Sikiba said of, of a print publication called Vitoria es Certa or Victory is Certain. Um, although it's interesting that in the image, it's not named, although the newspaper is named, it's got its name written across the top. top the radio station is unidentifiable, but they're listening to a radio. And it's interesting to me the way in which that's in certain ways sort of erases the history of radio, even as it's making it present in urban space. So that was one, one piece of urban space or built space in the capital that called my attention to the history of radio. The other one is the radio building itself. Um, what is today Radio Nacional de Angola, or the state broadcaster, um, was a building that was built in the mid-1960s in the midst of the liberation struggle. And it was great evidence, you know, it's kind of a mid-century modernist, brutalist building um, that was very good evidence of the colonial state's response to these guerrilla broadcasters. 
So that also sits, you know, it's um, a really important, it's in, a, it's in a very significant part of the city, right next to the, to the MPLA party headquarters um, and near a number of other things, the military hospital. So I was struck also by the, you know, the, the presence of this enormous building and what, what could that building tell us about um, how these broad these radio broadcasters made the state in fact nervous and um, my third set of sources were you know kind of classical documentary sources and those are from the secret police archives in lisbon where i found literally thousands of pages of transcriptions of radio broadcasts um, of secret police catching people or looking for people who might be listening to these illegal stations. Um, and that's between, I think, the big radio station building um, and reading you know, thousands of pages of these documents, I began to think about the ways in which um, these guerrilla broadcasters made the colonial state so nervous. Um, and that that nervousness had something in particular to do with sound technology, that it wasn't just the fact that there was more information out there. Um, you know, the same thing could be found in these, what were illegal papers and things like that. But the fact of it being in the form of sound made a huge difference in creating this sense of nervousness. Um, so I would find these descriptions of, of um, the secret police or, or sort of memos from the head of the secret police saying, you know, speculating about who was listening. And of course they were concerned not just with um, Africans listening, but they were concerned that white settlers in Angola, Portuguese settlers, were also listening in, right? So it was illegal for everybody, and they worried that um, Portuguese settlers would also be influenced, that um, black civil servants who worked for the colonial state would be listening in. Um, and so there were huge numbers of speculations about where, where was it being broadcast from, how were people listening, um, there were people um, some secret police officers contended that people living in the informal neighborhoods in the Musex um, kept two radios in the house, one in the front to listen to the colonial broadcaster and one in the back to tune in to the guerrilla radio stations. So they, you know, you can see them like in reading these documents, I could see them sort of speculating and imagining the, um, the subversion at work. Um, and that indicated to me a kind of nervousness on the part of the colonial state. Um, I think it's interesting also that there are very few sound recordings, in fact, and in fact, the secret police archives, though they recorded everything, they did not, um, those recordings have not been um, preserved over time. Um, in part, that has to do with the particular history of Portugal, the fact that there was a military coup, but the secret police themselves also destroyed material. So one of the things I learned in reading these documents was that at the top, they often had a date, the date on which they were recorded and the date um, at which they should be destroyed. Um, so there was also a, a kind of deliberate erasure um, on the part of the colonial state of the archive that they were actively um, producing. And in fact, for the years that there are, there is material, they only exist because there was a military coup in Portugal that brought the, the Portuguese fascist state to an end and insisted on preserving that material. Um, but I'm struck by the ways, and I think this is not surprising for anybody who does radio studies, it's sort of, a, it's become a banal observation, but it's always the thing I think that shocks people outside of radio studies, which is that very often we are relying on documents, we are relying on oral histories, and we're not relying, in fact, on the sound itself. Um, so let me just say one more thing. I think um, I also used, um, Fanon was really key for me in, in um, helping me to think about the significance of guerrilla radios, and in particular, what it meant to people. And he talks about um, uh, radio listening as a kind of technique. And I think one of the things that we talked about in all of the workshops was the um, and worried about was, you know, did the colonial state, did various colonial states, did the apartheid state jam the broadcasts of these guerrilla radios? Um, and some of us could find more evidence, some of us could find less. Um, in the Angolan material, there's a lot of discussion about jamming, but I found it very, very hard to substantiate. Um, but what I did learn from doing oral historical work was that people, and also from reading the transcripts um, 
in the secret police archives was that transmission was often not good and that people had to fill in for what they couldn't hear, which is something that Fanon discusses in the case of um, the FLN's radio in, in Algeria. And so we see there's a way in which people learn to listen differently um, and that they they're not often um, they're not only sort of mobilized to join movements, as as Seppo was pointing out, um, but often they have a sense of participation, particularly because it is sound, because it is simultaneous. People feel like they're participating in the struggle that's going on um, because they're tuning in and hearing sim simultaneously. And secondly, because they have to work to hear what's going on. And then they begin to share that information with others. Typically in the case of Angola, people would do this um, somewhat secretly, people who were involved in small clandestine organizations um, and in cells would speak to one or another person, um, sometimes one of the women that I spoke to talked about being in a group that that hid their clandestine political um, agitation under the cover of um, religious piety. So on a day in, in the Catholic Church or a season in the Catholic Church where there was typically a service, um, they would use that to cover for the fact, because it was at the same time as the Angola Combatente broadcast, they would use that to cover for the fact that, in fact, they were turning into the guerrilla, tuning into the guerrilla radio, and then gathering to exchange information about what they'd heard and fill in the gaps in what other people had heard, or pass along the information to those who had not been able to listen in. Um, so, I think that, in fact, there's a tremendous richness of material, um, and that um, radio is fascinating for the ways in which it also um, spurs these um, these affective relations, right? And it helps expose or helps show us the importance of emotion and affect in thinking both about mobilization um, on the part of listeners, as well in terms of the response of the colonial state and this kind of nervousness, which is something I drew from, in fact, one of the other um, participants in the book, Mozi Chikawero, his, his work on radio, um, as well as the work of Nancy Rose Hunt. So I think I'll just stop there, um, and I look forward to hearing others. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Worma, for your revealing discussion on the use of perceptions of radio in Angola's liberation struggle. Uh, as Dr. Shlongwane has not yet arrived, unfortunately, uh, I suggest we move on to hearing about uh, Mr. Lloyd Hasvinay's uh, chapter. Uh, so Lloyd, the uh, floor is up to you, open to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laszlo. Before I proceed, uh, may you please confirm if you can hear me clearly? Yes. I don't want to end up uh, spending the day talking to myself. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, so I'm going to briefly highlight uh, the key arguments, the key highlights in our two chapters, uh, two co-authored chapters. I'm so glad uh, one of uh, my colleagues, uh, Munya, is here. So Munya, please feel free to chip in now. Yeah, so chapter six and chapter seven are the two chapters that we co-authored. And um, so in our chapter six, uh, we focused uh, on Zappos' uh, guerrilla radio, um, the voice of the revolution. So the paper, the chapter is a culmination of work that was conducted at the National Archives of Zimbabwe in Harare. So at the National Archives of Zimbabwe, we're quite lucky to stumble upon uh, transcripts uh, of the broadcasts that were uh, created uh, by the BBC, uh, the BBC Africa Radio, and also by the Southern Rhodesian government uh, itself, particularly by the intelligence. It is very interesting to note that um, the colonial government itself and its respective um, um, in, uh, its respective uh, individuals and institutions were also listeners. So they created these uh, transcripts and presented them to parliament in order to create laws that would enable surveillance and regulation of shortwave radio technology. So most of the transcripts that we use that we use we actually presented to Parliament as evidence of um, uh, work that was being done by guerrillas in Zambia. 
So it's 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 uh, we also relied obviously on um, oral interviews, and one of the key individuals that we interviewed is Jane Lungi Lenguenya, who was uh, the key broadcaster. She's sort of the pioneer of um, broadcasting for 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 Zappo. Unfortunately, Jane passed away about a month ago. Uh, may her so rest in peace. Uh, so uh, basically, we the argument uh, that we are putting across in this particular chapter um, is that radio technology was introduced um, as an instrument to to term what uh, Mose in his chapter calls the native mind. It was introduced uh, through the Native Affairs Department, which was a very influential and important. Uh, department for the colonial government as a tool to educate uh, the Africans in, a, in addition to what was called native education. So radio technology was introduced as one of the many tools to the mind in courts. So it is in this context that uh, the colonial, the British colonial office supported the introduction of what we called saucepan radios. So this was a radio set that was shaped like a saucepan. It was round in shape. Uh, it was also nicknamed the poor man's radio. It was powered uh, by batteries and um, it was quite uh, fashionable those days. And it was owned mainly by people who worked uh, for the colonial government, uh, business people, shop owners, um, and those that um, that had access to, 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 to that kind of technology. So in the 1950s, this kind of radio technology was used um, um, as a yardstick to measure um, uh, how Africans were mod modernizing or to measure civilization among Africans. So the colonial administrators believed that being able to listen to radio and being able to make sense of radio broadcasts was actually um, a form of modernity. It was actually a form of civilization. So Africans who had uh, mastered this ability to listen to radio and to make sense of radio broadcasts were regarded as um, modern and progressive Africans. So the British believed that radio was a technology that was supposed to uh, ensure loyalty to the empire. And Mose captures this, 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 the, the origins, uh, this, this kind of an argument clearly in his chapter. So we also reinforce that 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 argument with the uh, historical evidence to argue that the colonial administrators believed that radio technology was actually meant to uh, benefit the colonial government, unlike in countries where, uh, such as South Africa where the introduction of radio amongst Africans created debate in, in parliament. In southern Rhodesia, um, th they did not foresee uh, the backfiring of technology, uh, radio technology in, in particular. So in this particular chapter, we try to capture how radio technology was introduced into southern Rhodesia. Uh, so, um, for us, 1965 November is a very important date when it comes to understanding uh, the history of radio broadcasting um, by guerrilla movements. Why 1965? 1965, Ian Smith, uh, the Prime Minister of Southern Rhodesia, introduced uh, the Unilateral Declaration of Independence. So the, the UDI resulted in three major things. Number one, it uh, came with um, uh, a state of emergency, imprisonment of national leaders without trial. Um, so they were, uh, the key leaders were arrested and detained uh, at places such as Konakudzingwa and Wawa prison. Uh, number two, it also resulted in a number of nationalist leaders going into exile. Um, and Zambia was um, a favorable place, was a favorable place of refuge for most Zappo leaders because they had a very strong uh, relationship with um, the independent Zambian government led by Kenneth Kaunda. 
Um, so these two uh, these two factors resulted um, in Zapu establishing its radio in Zambia. So it was the relationship between the UDI and uh, and the and the and the and the liberation struggle. So in 1965, this is when we see the radicalization of the liberation struggle. So uh, Zambia Broadcasting Services offered. Um, the voice of the revolution at time, um, guerrillas were given the opportunity to speak to the masses back at home. Uh, so in this chapter, we also try to do a bit of a comparison with um, the sister broadcasting uh, uh, with, with uh, ZANU's um, uh, voice of Zimbabwe. And one of the major differences that we identify is that Zappos radio was mainly dominated by the key nationalist leaders. Um, I have examples here of uh, people such as Jason Ziapapamoyo, who was at some point in time Zappos vice president, George Slundika, who was at some point in time uh, the publicity and information secretary, George Nyandoro featured regularly on Zappos Voice of the Revolution, Edward Novu, Stephen Parerenyatwa, James Kerema, and lastly Jane Gwenya. So these were the big names when it comes to the nationalist struggle in Zimbabwe. Uh, so unlike unlike um, the voice of Zimbabwe, which was uh, controlled by the ZANU, ZAPU allowed the nationalist leaders to also operate as broadcasters. Um, they went through a bit of training um, uh, at uh, in Zambia, uh, in Lusaka. Um, so, so we try to compare the differences, and uh, on the ZANU side, it was mainly the guerrillas, the ordinary guerrillas, people such as uh, Nyasha Donald Musiwa, whom we covered in, in Chapter 7. So these were ordinary guerrillas who had um, escaped the country to go and join the liberation struggle, and those are the people who sort of became uh, the, the, the key figures when it comes to broadcasting. So it's one of those differences that we, we tried to, to identify in this, in this particular chapter. Uh, in this chapter, we also uh, capture how uh, the voice of the revolution's broadcasting uh, techniques and its successes created conflict uh, between Zambia, independent Zambia, southern Rhodesia, and also the British government. Uh, um, so there is evidence that uh, the British government was sort of uh, pouring money into Zambia to support uh, broadcasting. Uh, so there is evidence, there is historical evidence of British money being poured into Zambia to support broadcasting. And then uh, ZAPU was also being supported by Zambia Broadcasting Services. So Britain was caught in a diplomatic conflict because the Southern Rhodesian government believed that um, the British were supporting uh, these guerrilla broadcasts because there was evidence of British money. And um, so when these broadcasts started uh, in 1965 into 1966, uh, the British, uh, sorry, the, the, the Southern Rhodesian colonial government went into a state of panic. And uh, Marisa and Mose have done a brilliant work in terms of conceptualizing this panic. And they have coined this um, amazing uh, phrase, a nervous colonial state, to discuss how, to describe how the colonial governments went into a state of panic. And uh, you might be wondering, how did they panic? Uh, so the Southern Rhodesian government um, began to invest uh, money into jamming um, um, uh, the frequencies that were coming into Zambia. So they installed a transmitter close to the Zambian border, and this big transmitter, which costed them a fortune and a half, uh, was nicknamed the Big Beta Transmitter, and it was in it was uh, specifically erected to jam uh, the signals that were coming into southern Rhodesia from Zambia. Uh, amongst other things, they also tried to regulate the cell, um, uh, the cell and the distribution of radio batteries. 
because the radio later on became an enemy. So they realized later on that the radio uh, is the one which is promoting um, um, guerrilla information into the country. So they began to regulate the, the, the sale and the distribution of radios for battery sets. Uh, so in this chapter, we also um, capture how uh, the effectiveness or the impact of uh, the voice of the revolution. And uh, we included testimonies of guerrillas who were recruited through the radio and the relationship that uh, the broadcasters built with their listeners. Um, uh, and different people who joined the liberation struggle, particularly, uh, especially between 1978 and 1979, indicated that they were lured or they were convinced to, to join the liberation struggle as a result of uh, the broadcast that were coming, especially from one Jane Nguenya, who was very clear and was very militant in terms of her approach. Um, so this uh, leads us into uh, chapter seven, uh, in which we discuss the lived experiences of two figures. One is Jane Lungilanguenya, who was a female broadcaster and a member of the Zapu National Executive. Jane had earlier been arrested and detained at Konaguzingwa and then later on Wawa. And then when she heard that she was one of the people on the list of people with supposed to disappear. She then escaped the country into Zambia. And in Zambia, she continued uh, with her work of synthesizing and conscientizing the people through uh, radio. So uh, Jane uh, became the mother of the revolution when it comes to broadcasting because she was on radio regularly and she built a very strong relationship with the listeners to the extent that she was no she was she was not allowed to leave radio by her superiors including uh joshua nkomo because she has she had built a very strong relationship with her listeners um she also was able to train other uh, broadcasters and interestingly she identified female guerrillas to work in radio as opposed to male to males. Uh, so it's it's one of those differences again that we can draw from um, Zap, Zapu's voice of the revolution and Zanu's voice of Zimbabwe. Uh, and then we also chronicled uh, the lived experiences of Nyasha Donald Musiwa, who joined uh, Zanu's voice of Zimbabwe in the late 1970s after leaving the University College of Rhodesia in Nyasaland where he was uh, studying towards a bachelor's in business administration. So the experiences of uh, Nyasha, Donald Musiwa are important in showing how ZANU favored the intelligentsia. Um, one other broadcaster that we also interviewed, Mark Marongwe, had also left the university where he was studying law. Another broadcaster, Mijamurira had also left university. So ZANU had this bias towards uh, the intelligentsia, people who had acquired uh, a bit of education. So these people were needed because they constituted the propaganda machinery uh, of ZANU. So in conclusion, this chapter um, where we chronicle the biographies uh, helps us to understand the importance of individual agency and individual experiences in shaping the broad uh, propaganda machinery of uh, the liberation movements in Zimbabwe. So we are going against the argument that uh, propaganda was a product of the top-notch leaders. Propaganda, according to us in this chapter, um, was also a product of ordinary guerrillas who took it upon themselves to use their individual experiences to create uh, the propaganda that was needed to win uh, the hearts and minds of uh, the people. Laszlo, thank you so much for the reminder. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Lloyd. Um, yeah, uh, for your fascinating overview of the history of uh, guerrilla radio in Zimbabwe, uh, including your discussion of how uh, the Rhodesian state reacted to such radio broadcasts 
broadcasts as well as your sort of important biographical research on this topic. So thank you very much. Um, Tempo, uh, you say that uh, Ali is on his way or? I actually I, said, I actually oh. said that Ali was on his no, way. He just uh, text me now. I think he's registering to, to join us. Mm. It, uh, the link was uh, closed, so just give him, give him now the new one. Oh, okay, so a minute, should, a minute should, or two, we should be. Yeah, we'll wait for Dr. Flamboyne. Okay, thank you. All right, I think that's everybody. Um, so yeah, uh, the floor is yours, and uh, you have yeah about fifteen minutes uh, for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, is that me? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, thank you, and uh, my apologies for joining a bit late. Uh, I struggled with traffic, but also with the technology. Um, my presentation to be short uh, or contribution uh, to this book is on the PAC's radio program. Uh, in fact, most of the responses I have received so far are people expressing surprise that the PAC had um, uh, any pro broadcasting program whilst it was in exile. So that article itself is titled In Search of PAC Footprints because uh, the existing record, though still scattered with a lot of gaps, indicate that the PAC began broadcasting immediately they reached exile, particularly in Ghana at the time of Kwame Nkrumah. Um, and of course, after the coup in Ghana, they did a little bit of broadcasting in Egypt but also left Egypt and did more consistent broadcasting uh, in Tanzania. Given the contradictions within the PAC, the archive from 1962-63 until 1979 still has a lot of gaps. Uh, and I suspect the cause of those gaps is what I've just mentioned, the contradictions. But from 19 or from the 1980s, with the arrival of John Nyati Pokela uh, in and his attempts to reorganize the PAC and regroup it and refocus it, there is a consistent um, and a well-documented archive, handwritten some of it. Uh, which includes the PAC's views on the national and social question. It includes the PAC's views uh, on culture. But the most important are voices of ordinary members who were the ones responsible for broadcasting, as opposed to the voices of the leaders that are widely accessible through their speeches and the books they have written and a study of the broadcasts just gives you a better sense of what the ordinary foot soldiers who did not stay in hotels but lived under holes and hovels expressed their views and their understanding of um, the South African question. But also what is what the article uh, indicate is that um, or another area one still has to research in future is whether the PAC radio was re listened to internally. I mean, as an a PAC activist in my own right, I never listened to the PAC radio internally, except cassettes that were smuggled into the country. However, the thinking of most of the broadcasters and the people in the publicity and information department was that their agenda was to explain their cause to the countries that hosted them. So, the, and even the content of the broadcasts, you can tell that they were more on mobilizing international solidarity in the continent and outside of the continent. Um, it is only towards the 90s where there is a deliberate focus on the internal audiences and it is at the period when the PAC is also folding and returning home. Subsequent to the article in the introduction to the book, the editors indicate that there's a scarcity of documents um, or records of the PAC broadcast. 
However, I am a bit excited to indicate that since the book's publication, uh, I joined a PAC delegation to the University of Fort Hare, and I was able to access behind the scenes, and I found there a whole shelf of cassettes that have not yet been listened to, that no one has written about. So I'm hoping, hopefully in the new year, I could still make some time again and do some follow-up work, this time, you know, with having more access to uh, more material that has suddenly um, emerged. Of course, there is going to be a struggle with the technology that has become obsolete for me to find ways of um, how to access that material. Some it's in those old VHS cassettes, some it's in those uh, tape reels, and a few are uh, reel-to-reel cassettes. Uh, Fort here at the moment does not have any facility for those, but uh, I'm hoping when one gets the time and looks around, there will be an opportunity to... And then finally, of course, I hope uh, the article contributes in a better and a more nuanced understanding of the histories of the liberation struggle, which are being written post-1994, their complexities, and the fact that there isn't one single voice, but a multiplicity uh, of voices. Thank you. I'll end there. All right. Thank you very much for this uh, short but very interesting uh, presentation, Dr. Shongwane. As you know, I'm personally interested in the history of the PSC, and your, I think your chapter is very valuable to our understanding of the organization uh, and its uh, time in exile. Um, like uh, Professor Lechwati mentioned earlier, this is a unique contribution to the historiography, and I'm very glad that it's part of the book. Um, so now that we have uh, uh, heard from the three discussants and contributors of the book, uh, let us move on. Um, sorry, um, let us move on to the book discussion by Professor Elizabeth Gunner. And uh, Professor Gunner, you have 20 minutes. Uh, and yeah, it would be nice to hear uh, your summary uh, of the book uh, from the perspective of somebody who's been working uh, quite extensively on the use of radio as a medium. So thank you very much. Lovely. Well, thank you very much um, for inviting me. And um, thanks for doing the book. I mean, one thing that's very interesting about it is that um, I know you had two workshops, and there is somehow a kind of cohesiveness about the collection. Um, you, you're saying lots of different things, and you certainly don't come from one particular standpoint, but I think you can tell the value of the fact that you have all sat down and chewed over ideas and approaches. And so I think it makes the book that much more valuable and certainly, you know, as uh, Professor Marissa was saying, uh, she will teach with it. And there is a sense in which it, it gives a picture. Um, and what I like about it as a regional study, because I think at this particular moment, um, regional studies are incredibly important. Um, and what we have is a different mind map coming out. Because when you engage with this book, you are suddenly engaging with the region um, instead of the, the, the nationalist kind of bordered territories that we've been broken up into. There's a sense of, you know, what, what could have been and what could still be in terms of a region um, working and thinking and articulating together. So thank you for all that. I think it shows, as people have already said, the power of the media. And I think it also says a lot about the courage of the broadcasters, because broadcasters are these terribly important um, middle people that tend to be forgotten when we discuss radio. But in fact, their presence is huge. And certainly now, particularly in an age of artificial intelligence that we're moving into, the role of the individual voice as an anchor in a radio is very, very important. And that comes across in quite a number of your contributions and it is very interesting. So I think the courage of the broadcasters comes up in a number of chapters. 
Um, also, what comes up and has also been mentioned by contributors is people, that what you get from this is the voice of the people and the courage of the popular, the sense of popular culture as resistance. And I mean, I know that the radios were also, as you said, they were very didactic in many ways because they had an ideology to push across. But what, what I, I think comes across very powerfully, very powerfully is song and the enormous importance of the role of song. Now, why I get passionate about song is because what tends to happen with song that it gets sidelined as discourse. It's not seen as discursive in itself. Uh, it's simply put aside to be brought on at particular moments to get everybody feeling happy. Now, what becomes quite clear from the amount of um, space song has in this book, either through reference or to particular songs, I mean, um, Tsepo Molloy actually mentions particular songs, the chapters by Dumasani Moyo and uh, Chin, um, Chris Chinaka mention a huge thing about songs. Chikoero mentions songs. I mean, there wouldn't be anything to write about if there weren't songs there. So I think we have to um, give songs a new kind of weight in, in political discourse. Uh, and I, I think hugely important, um, as Marissa said, the whole role of affect is very important. But, you know, affect is part of discourse, I think. Now, I want to move on from my point about the importance of ordinary people and the idea of the imagined community that um, at least two, two, two chapters talk about, um, to what, um, again, Moyo and Chinaka sp spoke about. And you mustn't think that I'm only mad about the chapter by Moyo and Chinaka. I like all the chapters. But there's something I want to pick up on on that. They talk about the technology of the sign. So Foucault's technology of the sign. So it's not just the, tech, the technology of technology, you know. It's the technology of the sign that is so important. And the sign is the sign of culture. And the, the role, why song, particularly in the Zimbabwean chunk, if I can call it that, the Zimbabwean chunk of the book, four chapters of the book, there is this extraordinary acceptance of the role of song and the way in which what the Zimbabweans were really good at doing is going, bringing in the songs of the first Chimarenga. So you get actual the actual song that um, the spirit medium Nahanda used to use, sung in the second Chimarenga, Chimarenga and and so you have this continuity of social experience and you have this continuity of archival memory, cultural archival memory, which is presented as a reality through the cultural sign of the songs. And so that's why I think that the, the, the Zimbabwean contributors are absolutely right in, in emphasizing the importance of song. And in a way, uh, I feel with the South African, um, the way the South African radio freedom was used, it, it's there, it's very much there. But it's somehow the, the kind of um, power of it and the affect of it is not mentioned in quite the same way. But what is, what is terribly interesting though also is to think about radio as material object and what it's linked with. And I liked... Uh, Chico Uero's chapter where he said they used to listen to, even in jail, in that dreadful jail, I can't remember its name, but they had a little radio that was important as a material object. So we mustn't forget forget that. Um, so I think the imagined community is reached through song and it is configured through song. And then it becomes the educated community. So radio is creating an educated community. And what is also interesting is the interaction between the, um, the makers and the listeners. 
so what you get is you get this it's not a sense of being talked at although i know that um you say that um was voice of uh, uh, zimbabwe was made up of leaders um the voice of the revolution more of ordinary people um there's a sense of real inter interchange being being taking place um i want also to ask the question about the nature of nationalism and the fact that they these were guerrilla radios but they were also nationalist radios does that mean to say that they were also gendered radios i mean how do we look at the gendered archive um jane nguenya is clearly a most extraordinary and amazing figure in the archives of um revolutionary radio but she's quite exceptional Kosi Kaba is mentioned by Sakiba Lekhwati and by Tsepo Muloi. Nguenya is mentioned, I think, by all the Zimbabwean contributors. But the only other figure that is mentioned, the only other woman broadcaster that's mentioned, oh, besides, Nguenya is very important because she trains other women. So you get a sense through Nguenya of the importance of the female voice in radio. And you get a sense of the possibility of the female voice to shape, reshape patriarchy. Because I think, in a sense, there was a lot of patriarchy operating in, in the guerrilla movement, in the nationalist movements, and in the radios. So, in a sense, what you have with Nguenya and Kaba, of course, Kaba, an extremely important figure, and uh, Rosaria Tembe, is you get a re scripting a re kind of setting of gender and voice on this very important medium of radio. So I think that's something that, that needs some following up on. And the question about radio now <clears throat> and what the important importance of women's voices is and how a woman's voice on uh, radio can re-script gender balance is, uh, is I think, very important. Um, I also wanted to say um, what comes across as extremely interesting is what you write about languages. Um, and Alda, Alda Romao Sautis Haides chapter mentions um, that the, the, sta the station was uh, the Limo took great care to sometimes employ people who spoke, for instance, Nyanja. And also, and, and Rosario spoke uh, Ronga and Tsonga as well. And that, that, that was very important. So it was suggesting that Vozda Frelimo was really trying to find the people and engage with them and was not only using, um, you know, one of the, one of the uh, colonial languages. So, and, and, but what is also interesting about language is it gets used by the enemy. So there's a sense in which, I mean, Radio South Africa was brilliant at using African languages. You know, they thought that was the way to win people, but somehow it didn't work. And I think one of the reasons it didn't work was that they didn't know how to use song. And also, a Rhodesian Broadcasting Corporation used the African languages, but used them in a kind of condescending, infantile way. So that the real power and knowledge and wisdom that was part of the cultural archives of those languages was not really engaged with. And I think that makes it very different, a very interesting difference between how the guerrilla radios used African languages and how the um, Radio South Africa used them. Um, I think another thing that comes out of the book in a most interesting way is that this was a global operation in some ways. It, it, it shows the kind of global intersecting reach of radio as a medium. Um, the fact that, you know, there was this sense of precariousness and nomadicness about how the broadcasters and the stations went around. But at the same time, it was interconnected. You know, it was part of empire and post-empire. 
I mean, we don't know what the Russians were doing because we can't get the Russian archives, but we will get the Russian archives in due course. Um, you've got the BBC, the BBC really coming in heavy against um, the RBC and really putting its big guns, I think it was the Labour government at the important time, um, uh, into Zambia and into Botswana and actually employing um, Masia, I think it was, um, and key trainers to work. Um, the, so you've got, you've got the sort of arm of government and the arm of media in the case of the British working together. And it, it's interesting because it, it shows that the two sides of uh, the British in Africa, it shows the British as a colonial power, but it shows Britain as envisaging the possibility of being a post-colonial presence and um, you know, helping to train um, the guerrillas who are going to unseat these illegal white regimes. So I think um, that's extremely important. Um, so what lessons can we take from this very important book? What were the stations, how did they contribute to the, the learning and the emancipation of youth? Did they use youth only as an entry point to reinscribe gerontocracies and rule from the top? by small cliques who were revolutionary, but were not really going to change any basic configurations of gender and um, age power. That's just a question. And the same goes, as I've said already, to women. Um, so is there, when you look at the stations and you really compare them deeply, can you see the tensions? Can you see the possibilities of the really important germs that go through into sowing the seeds of a new democratic culture? So that when people remember um, listening, as Marissa Mormon points out, that they, they remember listening with such passion, they remember it with such joy. What we ask ourselves now is, how were the seeds planted for the conscientization of a lasting feeling of popular agency that we want to see in operation now? So that is a question I would like you very much as a team to, to follow up on. So I think I want to go back to end to talk about the importance of this book to the archive or to the archive on numerous levels and also the importance to national archives of memory that ordinary people because if we if we say that one of the important things that comes out of this book is that it created a platform for the importance of ordinary people to be recognized and in a sense heard where are those ordinary people now? And if we look at the sense of agency in the region that we live in, can we say that if there is a sense of the agency of people, the masses, is part of that sense of agency due to the courage and imagination and perseverance of the guerrilla radios in the region. I'll stop there. That's I finished that. Yep. <laughs> I was just switching on my uh, microphone. <laughs> uh, thank you very much uh, for that, uh, for your insightful observations, and uh, I guess shifting our attention to the importance of song as part of guerrilla radio and moving beyond the normal spoken forms of discourse that we often think about or focus on. I think it's also important uh, that you're highlighting the, the use of conducting further research on the role of gender uh, and voice uh, in this historiography. So um, let us uh, open up uh, the discussion to members of the audience. So if you have any questions for the speakers, please feel free to raise your hand or write them in the comment section. So uh, I'll collect uh, three questions uh, and then also indicate who you are conducting the question to. And yeah, thank you. 
Are there any specific questions from members of the audience? Levent, yes, please. Um, um, thank you very much, um, uh, Laszlo, and uh, thank you very much to the panelists. Um, I really enjoyed um, um, the presentations and I look forward to reading the book. Um, I'm not so sure whether it's a fair question because um, I, I haven't read the book, but um, and um, this one is, is directed to anyone who can actually answer this. Um, um, what have been the legacies of this guerrilla radios on um, post-colonial broadcasting services? Uh, I'm not so sure who, who can answer me, but uh, if anyone uh, uh, from um, Lloyd to Marisa or, or Peter, if they can actually um, answer that question for me. Thank you very much. Well, yeah, thank you, Clement. Uh, are there any other questions from members of the audience? Please raise your hand or uh, write your question in the comment box. Right, uh, seeing that there's no question so far, uh, yes, uh, I opened the question up to uh, the panelists. So is there anybody who would like to start the discussion? Okay, Lloyd, yes, please. Okay, thank you so much, Clement, uh, for this uh, interesting question. Um, I would love to invite Munya to also help me respond to this question. Um, but uh, Clement, um, the argument that we tried to establish in Chapter 6 is that uh, the process of uh, state making did not end in 1980 for Zimbabwe when uh, the country attained its independence. So we tried to uh, position the process of state making within guerrilla broadcasting. Uh, we tried to capture how the guerrilla broadcasters uh, imagined and envisioned the post-colonial state. Uh, and that kind of imagination did not end in 1980 when they got independence, but even in the 90s, um, the guerrillas remained, um, uh, maintain, maintained a firm grip on, on broadcasting. Uh, so one of the guerrilla broadcasters by the name uh, Great Chatonga, whose real name is Mark Marongwe, uh, who had been trained uh, in the 1970s, later on became uh, the director of broadcasting for the Indica Independent Broadcasting uh, Authority, which is uh, Zimbabwe Broadcasting Corporation. And most of the guerrillas, even in the 90s, sorry, most of the broadcasters, even in the 90s, I think you remember the name Simon Pasho Manube. I think you also remember the name Charles Love, who, whose real name is Webster Shamu. So they remained um, in the broadcasting, uh, in the broadcasting uh, services for for the independent uh, country. And these guys were very influential in creating, um, um, in, in in incorporating the guerrilla aspects uh, in independent broadcasting. Even the ideologies they also um, existed uh, in the post-colonial era. Even some of the songs, uh, even up to this day, uh, one of these uh, most popular songs uh, is uh, "Nzirazema Soja," uh, which was a sort of a code of conduct for Zandla, which was translated into a song. This song is still being uh, sung even on national television, on national events. Um, so th these are some of the aspects that we tried to incorporate the linkage between guerrilla broadcasting and um, post-colonial broadcasting techniques. Okay, thank you very much, Lloyd. Um, I have uh, Ali. Would you like to go first, and then Seki Bakiba, and then um, Munya Radzi? Yes, thanks. Um, I just have about a few comments to make from. Um, Liz is, you know, interesting questions that she has raised. One on language. Um, most of the <clears throat> of, of, of the archive of the PAC broadcasts are uh, in English. However, the biography, the one broadcaster who has since published a, a memoir uh, by the name of Ace Mdrashe, speaks about how he was part of a team 
that was translating into different African languages, the broadcasts. I have not located those. I don't know whether they are still in the tapes that I have not been able to access, but also it raises other questions that I need to investigate. If they were translating into African languages, who then was their audience? If they are partly saying their audience was largely the host communities that they wanted the host communities to understand the, the cause they, they, they were fighting. And then on the question of the, the female voice, I was able to pick up the names of about three women activists who participated in the PAC broadcasting. But because they used um, the underground names, I have struggled to locate them post-1994. I have only succeeded to find one, and then two I have since discovered they have since passed on, and uh, which is a pity because one of them was actually a journalist from a, a newspaper that was called The Voice before he left the country, she left the country to, to join the PAC. And in the context of the PAC, it would also be difficult to say what impact have the broadcasters had so-called post-apartheid, partly because the PAC was in a way defeated um, and uh, it, it, it really did not shape the new society that we are in. Um, most of its members, yes, were integrated into the army, including the former broadcasters um, in different areas of the military. But um, they are, even though some of them hold very high profile positions there, but I don't think they are shapers of the new policy. One or two went back into the SAPC when they came back into the country. But uh, my sense is that they are in the SAPC as employees and not as um, policy makers. And therefore, it, um, though one may still need to investigate, but uh, it's difficult at the moment to imagine whether the experiences of broadcasting uh, in a guerrilla radio is treated as having any value in the context of the SAPC even if it's post-1994. Thanks. Okay, next is Kiba Kiba. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Laszlo. And uh, le let me first um, uh, thank uh, Liz uh, for, for discussing this book and actually raising some very pertinent uh, uh, comments and questions. Uh, I, I, I have something to say very briefly about the issue of uh, uh, language, uh, which at uh, least you have raised uh, in relation to the voice of Fred Limo, that um, it paid so much uh, attention to the kind of languages um, that the broadcasters had to um, broadcast in. Uh, in fact, I, I would say that you know this was an issue for uh, many uh, of these uh, guerrilla radios in the region. The issue of language was very important because they had to think about uh, their audiences, uh, so that you know the messages that they uh, propagated would have to be understood. In, in fact, um, you know I've done I've done a lot of work um, on on radio freedom. Um, although, although my peculiar contribution, my own contribution to this book is mostly around the kind of support that host countries um, actually provided to uh, Radio Freedom. But in my other publications, I've, I've, um, I've discussed this issue of language quite extensively. Uh, that uh, the, the different um, dominant languages such as Isizu and and Isikosa, um, including Sisotho and Sipedi and Sitswana, as well as Chivenda and and Tsonga, 
these languages were, were, were used, especially in the news and current affairs programs. So, so it was really about making sure that the messages that uh, Radio Freedom uh, propagated would be understood by the audiences. And most importantly, in a in a in a uh, a meeting, I think an ex a report that was actually produced in 1973 on on Radio Freedom commented on this issue of language and and discussed quite extensively why Africans should also be a factor, uh, so that you know the you know the the radio should uh, reach out to African speaking. Uh, audiences, in, in particular the Kalats in the Western Cape, but also other people that might just be interested in listening to Radio Freedom, because there was this consciousness about um, Radio Freedom that it was it was about imagining a a new South Africa that would be multi, non-racial, and and so the issue of language also featured in that sense that Africans. Even though, as the mid 1970s approached, it became to be viewed as the language of the oppressor. But that language was also used on this radio uh, in order to get, um, in order to broaden the uh, uh, the listenership as well. The issue of um, gender, I think, uh, um, you know, it, it's an important one here as well. Even Ali has, has spoken about. Uh, you know, uh, PAC radio, but even on Radio Freedom, uh, there were female broadcasters. Um, you know, um, uh, ma many, many prominent, um, you know, broadcasters, many prominent politicians uh, today, uh, such as Vale Gambete, uh, was actually a broadcaster. Uh, but there were also ordinary broadcasters, such as Kosi Klava. Uh, so and and they were specifically responsible. Well, I'm not sure about um, you know Balagam better, but in relation to Kosi Klava, she was responsible in the 1980s more for sort of female uh, sort of female programs. So there were certain programs that catered specifically for uh, for females uh, issues around um, reproductive health, bringing up children. Uh, but then there were also programs that included um, a female broadcaster that, that had to deal with conscientization of the people in the country. Uh, I could go on and on, but I, I think I should stop here in the interest of uh, uh, being more inclusive of other people. I think uh, Clement you raised a very good question. Um, and and my, my, my short response, just to add to what uh, Ali has, has, has actually said, is that these broadcasters were actually brought, former broadcasters of Radio Freedom, were brought in as um, as employees. Uh, although one of them, I'm just re you know not remembering the name now, actually became a CEO, a chief executive officer, who was actually a broadcaster in exile. So, so in a sense, I mean, there's a, there's a way in which policy can be affected at some level, but the the ANC. Many of the broadcasters actually went into broadcasting as employees, whereas others actually went elsewhere into intelligence and so forth. Um, I, I, I don't think it, it seems that the uh, ANC wanted to or was hoping that uh, Radio Freedom could could uh, could could be sort of recreated within the SABC, but it didn't quite it didn't quite happen because. The SABC was a public broadcaster, which had um, which allowed for multiple voices and so forth. But there's a way in which one sees an attempt to try to influence policy, especially at the level of the of the board of the SABC, where the board itself would actually be have a a, a large number of board members being uh, ANC people. So I'll I'll stop there to allow for others to actually chip in. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Nyaradzi, uh, you had your hand up earlier. Thank, thanks, Laszlo, and uh, thanks to all the, the presenters and um, 
to the organizers. I think this is a very fascinating forum. And um, um, I think for the sake of time, I have a number of issues, but I'll just try to go straight to, to what I would like to, to say. And also thanks, I think, to, to Elizabeth for a very fascinating discussion of the book. You raised very important, uh, important issues and observations. And so I would like to respond to Clement's question and also in the same way to maybe some of the issues raised by, by Elizabeth in terms of the role of radios on the youth in a post-colonial uh, dispensation. Uh, speaking from experience, I can tell you that uh, as a Zimbabwean at independence, you know, the, the only songs that I knew and I was able to sing were mainly uh, liberation war songs, you know, at independence. And when, when, when the former uh, Rhodesia Broadcasting Corporation became the Zimbabwe Broadcasting Corporation, actually uh, many of the songs which were being played or, you know, uh, aired through and through had to do with experiences of the war. And I think, you know, the, the ruling party, ZANU-PF, did it deliberately in a way to try and rally again the masses, get support through and through. And in a way, to some extent, it was a form of uh, a unified, unified, trying to unify, to unify the nation. But having said that, that, that it looks like it was a way of trying to unify the nation. On the other hand, when you look at it, I think, I, I don't have the statistics, but I can hazard that uh, uh, over 70% over of the content was Shona, uh, forgetting about you, mainly the other major player. If we want to split into two major players in the liberation struggle, ZANU, PF on one hand, and uh, ZAPO on the other hand, who during the struggle for liberation played equally important roles. And if we confine it to the whole idea of uh, uh, war radios, yes, we have already seen, you know, ZANU and its own war radios, Voice of Zimbabwe, and then ZAPO, Voice of the Revolution. But uh, come independence, what happens is now ZANU was in power, ZANU was in control, it controlled the content, it controlled the ideology and stuff. Most of these songs were mainly shown at the expense of Pentevelle. And so it then created some kind of divisiveness or some kind of divide to a point where now, you know, ethnic tensions were even getting widened. And they even got worse, you know, with, uh, we, you know, with uh, the, the Midlands, Matebelele and conflict, which has come to be known in, 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 the, in, in, in discourse today as the Gukura Wound massacres. Because uh, during those problems, during those disturbances, people in Matebele and the Midlands were now being forced to sing Shona songs and most of these war liberation songs. And that created a lot of tension and a lot of hatred between the two groups because now it's like they were being forced a language that they did not want. So, so that's what I can say in terms of trying to say what, what, what was the kind of impact and what is kind of, you know, uh, 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 happened. So on one hand, as I say, to start with, you know, in the early days, it was for unifying purposes. But at the end, when the state slowly became, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, dictatorial and monopolistic and what have you, and then people beginning to awaken and to criticize the establishment and what have you, ZANU-PF or the establishment did not stop from continuing to use you know, liberation, you know, reminders, liberation was. I remember, I think, at a time when, uh, at the height of the MDC and the time, I think there was a song that was played every day, all the time, that many of us would sing it without even knowing, to remind us of the struggle. If we were to vote, let's say, the opposition into power and stuff, and we were told, you know, this is what is going to come. So I can say ZANU-PF continued to use these songs from the liberation struggle deliberately to force its own agenda. So it was a form of some form of some form of coercion, if you want. And uh, um, um, so I, I am not sure whether I've tried to respond to both Elizabeth and Clement this question in terms of uh, in terms of the, the the legacies of these war radios, you know, on the post-colonial 
post-colonial dispensation. But I, I can say that, you know, uh, the, 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 the liberation war radios actually became instruments again for state coercion and for, uh, you know, pushing their own, their own agenda. Savelo uh, Ngyovugacheni talks of actually what he calls the Chimurenga monologue, you know, whereby when he talks of the Chimurenga monologue, he simply says that this is a particular rendition of the modern history in a partisan and one-sided way, you know, that buttresses the claim by one ethnic group, you know, and political party to be the heroic, you know, uh, progenitors of the nation, uh, you know, uh, at the expense of other, other other players, and so there is that continued feeling, and so uh, basically this is what 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 I could say in terms of you know uh, both the issues raised by Elizabeth and the question posed by Clement. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, um, Zepo. Uh, would you like to contribute, or are you good? Uh, thank you very much, uh, colleagues. I will be representing uh, Majinette Molopiani. She, she had a family emergency. So my name is Marcus Mapila uh, from the University of the Free State Library. Uh, thank you very much, uh, panelists, editors, contributors, for making such a wonderful uh, record. I think for those of us who grew up listening to to guerrilla radios will know that uh, you know uh, how difficult it was it was because at times we had to switch off the fires just so that we can learn few struggle songs especially in south africa from some of the comrades who were in exile and it was always um, very interesting because we didn't know when the station is going to come on and sometimes it would change the channel so many times uh, that you would not know uh, what what is happening. But it was always very very interesting that uh, we 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 became part of the history uh, 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 about uh, the guerrilla stations in in a library and archival sciences. Uh, preservation is a set of activities aimed to prolong a life of a record, a monologue, a, or an artifact. And we are very happy that uh, today, after so many years, uh, not seeing anything specifically from a guerrilla radio uh, 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 broadcasting, speci especially if, if there are any other recordings that are available, that today we are in touch and we are able not far to, to have a record such as this. And as a library, we're actually very excited that we, we, we hope to look after this uh, a record and hope that it, it finds its way, its way into the mainstream curriculum so that then further research and further work uh, continues around a, a, a broadcasting so that those who are today looking at communication, looking at social media, are able to have an understanding of where it all started because obviously you can see that uh, it, there was a situation i think at one time in egypt where where there was a big uh, a, 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 a strike about the president and social media became a very a, a, a crucial thing you know in in studying that uh, that that protest but in in africa uh, and and even in the earlier years uh, a, a, a guerrilla uh, radio stations became that so, so we're actually very excited that today we have come uh, to this and we, we remain hopeful that work will continue uh, so that then we were able to have a, a, you know, a, this available in our libraries and eventually becoming part of, of the curriculum. So I really wish to thank Dr. Mloy for approaching the library to, to, you know, to start this work. And we are, we are, we are very, very, very much happy uh, that that we we are part of this historic uh, uh, event, small as it is, you know, small fires they normally start like this, and and we are hopeful that a uh, community uh, uh, interaction will will continue, so that then maybe some of the chapters, as as we begin to look at specifics, 
uh, might then become a, a, a topics on, on their own right so that then we we, we know we continue to, to have this and maybe in the later stage they try to find those people who are in exile who are maybe some of them part of this uh, 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 radio, radios i know in bloomfontein there was one flexman kopane who was one uh, a broad, who was a broadcaster uh, the, the late kopane and and at one time i think we were interacting he said to me uh, i could not even tell people that i'm a broadcaster because of the danger that i will end up my family will end up at the back of a Kuala Kuala going to John Foster Square, just for me becoming part of a, a, a broadcast. And some of them, when they came back, they joined the army, like a, 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 I think Ali was saying that. We're not seeing them actually coming up to tell the story of what really t you know, happened to, 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 you know, to, to, to run a, a, this type of, of a broadcast. So I'm really uh, excited and happy. Thank you very much to all of you. Uh, thank you for that day, Lehwati, uh, Marissa, uh, Ali, Elizabeth, and our, 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 our facilitator, Lloyd. And thank you very much for Ms. Nambita for the technical work that is, she, she, she's doing at the back. And thank you for Zuki, the campus librarian, for, for, for finding this book and for actually making sure that it happens. You can see it happened on a Friday almost. It didn't happen because we are almost in, uh, you know, towards a long weekend and everyone is just on the road. But finally, we are here and we remain hopeful that it will actually happen. So thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for, for, for allowing us to be part of this historic uh, activity. Thank you. Uh, we can hear you, uh, Laszlo. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, I said thank you, uh, Mr. Mapile, for your concluding remarks and support, and hopefully this collaboration can continue in the future. Um, okay, Tsepo or Seki Bakili, uh, can you, um, uh, do you want to have the final word? Uh, yes, sure. Uh, Tsepo, like maybe first? you want to say something? Yeah, I'll, I'll just go first, okay. just to remind uh, or just to provide information uh, to everyone that this book is available in soft cover, as you have seen, um, at uh, Vets, uh, from Vets Press. Mm. Uh, it, it actually costs 400, only 420 <laughs> rand, uh, unlike the hard copy, which is more than uh, 1,000 rand. So this is much more affordable. Uh, we hope that we have provided, provided some teasers uh, about the book and uh, so hopefully you can just go out there and get your copies uh, of the book. So thank you so much for uh, for hosting us uh, in University of the Free State and Laszlo, thank you for chairing. Uh, and, and lastly, of course, uh, Liz, we really appreciate uh, the work that you have done in terms of just, um, you know, going through and asking pertinent questions. Thank you so much. Tepo? Sure. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Lars. Uh, just to echo what uh, Siki was saying, I'd just like also to thank everyone, particularly the organizers. Uh, I think this was uh, a good uh, show. And then um, the, the discussant, uh, uh, Liz, I know that we asked you at a very short uh, time, but you are very grateful to agree. And then by the ju judging by the comments, I think you read <laughs> the whole book. <laughs> in just over two, three, four days. So I really, really appreciate it. And the comments that you gave us, uh, you made, I mean, uh, really very uh, helpful. I think moving forward, we'll be able to come up with another volume, looking at some of the aspects that you, you raised. Um, and then, uh, Laszlo, thank you again. Uh, you did a fantastic job. I think we, in terms of time, we managed to I we're just five minutes late in terms of what we're supposed to when we're supposed to end. But uh, you you it seven it minutes better. later, Tepo, so. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much, and uh, to everyone, enjoy our long weekend. Let's uh, meet uh, next week, and hopefully, when uh, things have uh, improved, we'll be able to meet and uh, launch it uh, where we'll be able to see each other and uh, have a bit bit of wine, as uh, Prof. Lepati said. Thank right. you. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know if I can throw something in here that we will have another launch of this book uh, by Vets Press around the 13th of October. We will circulate um, 
information about it in advance. So uh, please be on the lookout for that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kiba, Tepo, Elizabeth, and all others who are here, including members of the audience. I wish you all a wonderful afternoon. So, goodbye. Thank you.